Yes. Yes, Mr. Richardson. My Lord, um, I appear with my learned friends Mr. Copeland and Miss Hart for MGI. My learned friends Mr. Purvis and Miss Pickard appear for Illumina. And as previously indicated to the court, uh, I'll be addressing the appeal on the nucleotide patterns with my learned friend Mr. Purvis responding for Illumina. And then Mr. Hinchliffe and Ms. Jamal will be attending later on behalf of MGI to deal with the labeled nucleotide patterns. And Mr. Atland will be attending on behalf of Illumina. My Lords, we've divided the time up, and I hope to sit down uh, sometime after lunch with my learned friend responding this afternoon uh, and tomorrow morning if necessary. And with a fair wind, we should have finished this appeal by lunchtime tomorrow or even sooner. As I understand it, my learned friends, Mr. Hinchliffe and Mr. Ackland, uh, hope to complete the labelled nucleotide patent in less than a day. So we are well within the three-day estimate, and hopefully we'll run short uh, of that. Depending, of course, a little on, on your lordships. All right. So, my lords, turning first to my appeal on the nucleotide patents, there are two limbs to the appeal, priority and obviousness. And if it's convenient to the court, I'm going to deal with the priority appeal first, for reasons which I will explain, and then turn to obviousness. Uh, and so the path I propose to take is as follows. Um, after a brief introduction, I will start with a law on the priority. Then I will turn to the judgment and highlight the findings of the judge on the common general knowledge and the disclosure of the patent, then turn to his findings on the priority document and uh, show where we submit the judge went wrong in his approach to priority. Then I will move on to the issue of obviousness, look at how the judge dealt with the prior art, Zavgorodny, uh, and again show in our submission how his treatment of obviousness was inconsistent with his approach to priority, and how, had he been consistent in his approach to the disclosures of the priority document and the patent, he should either have found there to be a lack of priority or a finding of obviousness. Uh, and by way of introduction, that lack of consistency is really the kernel of our appeal. We have throughout uh, this action argued that the patent could not be both inventive and maintain priority. It's fair to say that before the judge, we pushed the obviousness end of the seesaw the hardest. Uh, but on this appeal, we lead with priority. And that is as a result of the way in which the judge characterized the invention in the patents. And that, of course, is key to both the issues of priority and obviousness. Um, and it's fair to say there wasn't much discussion of that issue of tr at trial. And the judge's characterization of the inventive concept really emerged for the first time uh, as the judge wrote his judgment. Uh, and as I shall show you, he held that the inventive contribution was greater than we had submitted was appropriate at trial. Um, and as a result of that, it perhaps became easier for him to write a judgment holding that there was an inventive step over the prior art, because on his analysis, there was apparently more blue water between the prior art and the patent. But the error that the judge made was not to reflect that same invention in his assessment of the priority document. And when it came to priority, in our submission, he treated the invention in the second priority document as a lesser contribution. And that enabled him <clears throat> to hold that the priority doc document was enabled at the relevant date because there was a smaller gap in our submission between the priority document and the common general knowledge. And this gap was on the judge's findings plausible and sufficiently enabled. But of course, we say that that approach was in error because the invention in the priority document needs to be the same as the invention in the patent for there to be a valid claim to priority. Uh, and this is where the judge's inconsistent approach becomes most stark. Because had the judge treated the disclosure of the priority document in a manner consistent with his treatment of the patent, he should have held that the invention in the patent was not enabled by the priority document based on his findings on the common general knowledge. Alternatively, had he assessed the contribution of the patent in a way which allowed a valid claim to 
claim to priority, he should have found it lacked inventive step, because on that basis there was far less between the prior art and the patent, and that gap was obvious to bridge. So, my lords, we say we win uh, one way or the other, um, and I shall start with uh, the route through priority, if I may. So, my lords, I'm going to spend a, a little time just um, outlining the law on priority. There is a little bit in dispute between us, um, and so I'm going to take your lordships, if I may, to uh, the leading authorities to show uh, your lordships where the law is. Um, can we start first in the joint authorities bundle at tab three? Mr. Justice Jacobs, who then was in Beloit, uh, and there's a short passage on priority beginning on page 732 of the report, uh, 68 of the bundle. And uh, on page 68, uh, no, page 732 of the report, at line 35, the judge um, sets out. Uh, the law of priority um, according to section 5.2 of uh, the Patents Act and uh, the, the most important sentence is at line 48 5.2a if an invention to which the application in suit relates is supported by matter disclosed in the earlier relevant application or applications the priority date of that invention shall instead be the date of filing um, uh, of, of the earlier document and uh, the judge went on on top of 733, he explains, the matter disclosed in the priority document really means information concerning the invention disclosed in that document. And then he quoted from Mr. Justice Aldous in Shearing, Biotech's application, and perhaps if your lordships would just read uh, the quote um, from Mr. Justice Aldous uh, and the paragraph below that. Two sentences from uh, Ms. Uh, that passage, which I, we rely on in particular, it's Mr. Justice Alder saying the word support means more than that and requires the description to be the base which can fairly entitle the patentee to a monopoly of the width claimed. Uh, and he then refers to the Biogen case in the EPO, uh, where the Board of Appeal uh, said the scope of protection in the claims must be fair, having regard to the way in which the invention is described. And then uh, Mr. Justice Jacob said, uh, emphasised it has to be the same invention at line 29. Um, and we say this, this theme, uh, this uh, requirement for fairness and the requirement to have the monopoly uh, supported um, uh, fairly across its breadth uh, is consistent both throughout the English and the uh, EPO authorities. Then, if I may, <clears throat> could I turn to tab 7? And this is now <coughs> Lord Justice Jacob in Unilin. Uh, and the passage, relevant passage, starts on page 70 of uh, the report 224 of the bundle. And this time, uh, Lord Justice Jacob starts with um, Article 87.1 of the European Patent Convention. Um, and he sets that out at paragraph 38. And it's the reference there to the same invention um, on the penultimate line. He goes on to say that it's better to use the EPC rather than the different words in the Patents Act. I don't think much turns on that at this stage. Um, then on page 71, in paragraph 40, he refers back to the Paris Convention, um, and there's a reference in that in the middle of the passage from that to 
the requirement for unity of invention. Uh, and he goes on in 41 to refer to the leading case in the EPO on priority, case G2 of 98. Um, and the question there was uh, whether the requirement of the same invention um, uh, covers material implicitly disclosed in the priority application. And then the uh, quote, uh, the finding of a whole, what the Board of Appeal held in 42, um, familiar wording, uh, priority can only be acknowledged if the skilled person can derive the subject matter of the claim directly and unambiguously using common general knowledge in the previous application as a whole. Uh, and then Lord Justice Jacobs set out some of the reasoning of the board, um, and that uh, does help understand um, the, the wording in their ruling. So, uh, start of 43, there's a quote um, uh, where they say, in order to assess the claim, uh, they look at the distinction in one of the cases at the top of 72. Um, uh, between technical features which are related to the function and affect the invention and technical features which are not. Um, they then, just below the top hole punch, go on to point out that um, the de definition of the technical features which are related to the function and those which are not may change during the course of um, prosecution uh, and opposition of a patent. And then in paragraph 9 of their decision, uh, they conclude as a result of this, uh, just below the middle of the page. From the analysis under point 8 above, it follows that an extensive or broad interpretation of the concept of the same invention um, uh, referred to in Article 87, making a distinction between technical features which are related to function and effect of the invention and technical features which are not, with a possible consequence that a claimed invention is considered to remain the same, even though a feature is modified or deleted or a further feature is added, is inappropriate and prejudicial to a proper exercise of a proper priority right. Rather, according to that analysis, a narrow or strict interpretation of the concept of the same invention, pointing it to the concept of the same subject matter referred to, is necessary. And they go on uh, just at below, uh, below the bottom hole punch to note that this requirement of consistency is the same uh, for the assessment of novelty and invented step. And so they. they uh, Connect uh, features together, and then you see the uh, just over the page the familiar wording: um, uh, subject matter of the claim directly and unambiguously using common general knowledge from the previous application as a whole. Um, Lord Justice Jacob then went on to refer to uh, the uh, <coughs> English law um, and uh, Lord Justice Aldous's pithy uh, summary in 44, um, referring back to Biogen priority document must contain sufficient material for the priority document to con constitute the enabling disclosure of the claim. Uh, and then there's a debate about whether or not uh, those issues have to be in, the cl in a claim form or just somewhere in the specification. Uh, and in 48, uh, Lord Justice Jacob summarised, uh, the approach is not formulaic. Priority is a question about technical disclosure, explicit or implicit. Is there enough in the priority document to give the skilled man essentially the same information as forms the subject of the claim and enables him to work the invention <coughs> in accordance with that claim? Uh, and we say that that is uh, a correct summary of the law. Then, if I may, um, uh, a brief passage in Medimune. This is at tab 10. And he said there and approved 
So the important thing is not the consistory clause or the claims of the priority document, but whether the disclosure as a whole is enabling and effectively gives the skilled person what is in the claim whose priority is in question. I would add that add it. I would add that it must give it directly and unambiguously. It's not sufficient that it may be an obvious development of what is disclosed. So it has to be there, not uh, merely something that you can find out um, uh, using uh, uninventive skills. Then, my lords, if we may go to the next tab, which is Hospira. Uh, and this is a first instance decision of uh, Mr. Justice Burse, and uh, picking it up on page 387 of the bundle, for some reason my judgment hasn't got individual uh, page numbers at the top, um, and it's paragraph 144, and uh, the judge there, he referred to the passage we just looked at in Medimmune. Um, and uh, he then uh, refers to uh, 146. He points out that priority documents don't have to have claims, so um, it would follow that you don't have to set out um, the invention in the same format, at least, but it does have to be there. And then he deals with the argument run in that case that there is n was no requirement for plausibility of the priority document in 147 to 150. Perhaps you'll, if your lordships would just read 147 to 150. Just to make a couple of submissions in, in relation to this passage, which we submitted, is contains an important principle um, uh, for the present case. Um, firstly, um, the judge cross referred to Biogen and Mediva in 149, and I'm afraid we haven't got that in the bundle, but um, uh, the passage he is cross referring to there is the familiar pa passage about principles of general application in Biogen and Mediva, where Lord Hoffman cites from Exxon in the EPO um, uh, and the passage that the extent of the monopoly should correspond to the technical contribution. So we say that is all um, of a piece um, and is just a mu as much of a requirement for priority as it is uh, for a granted patent. Um, the judge then referred to the reasonable prediction that the invention would work. Referring back to Regeneron, we say that is still good law. And the, the policy reasons he gives at the end of the uh, paragraph we say are important. If the requirement for plausibility and enablement wasn't present in a priority document, then a pat patentee could file a speculative priority document um, and steal an unjustified march on the competition. Um, and we say, for all the reasons I'm about to come to, to show you in, in Warner Lambert, the same policy must apply to priority documents. Otherwise, the abuse that the assumption uh, identified in Warner Lambert would exist uh, and patentees would be able to unfairly claim monopolies um, which they had not at that stage fairly justified. So well, we, we say um, this is a correct principle, although the judge was perhaps unusually disagreeing with a decision of the Technical Board of Appeal in Gemvax, we say he was right to do so and indeed um, Supreme Court authority in this country uh, militates um, uh, uh, this court to do so as well when considering the same issue, um, that, that is to say whether uh, 
an invention is properly supported, whether in the patent or in the priority document. Can I ask you what your submission is as to what the judge there meant in the final sentence when he says that in law the test for priority includes plausibility in a case like this one? What does he mean by in a case like this one? Well, well that case, um, Your Lordship, I'm absolutely right to pick this up, that case was a case about uh, a medical use and that is the area of law in which plausibility has been most, the, the, the most focus has been on the plausibility of the claim. That have you, you've said that this will treat a particular disease, you haven't been able to carry out your clinical trial because as soon as you did that you would invalidate your patent because you had to publish the, the trial taking place and no result. Um, and so there is always um, a, some leap of faith in a patent with a medical use in because you can never prove definitively that the drug will actually treat a patient. But there has to be a basis for claiming that medical use and, and that's the Warner-Lambert decision. Um, my learned friends seek to say uh, that in this case, because it's not a medical use claim, then the requirements for plausibility fall away. We submit that's wrong, uh, and I'm going to show you, Lordships, the authorities in, in support of that. Um, uh, so I, I accept the observation of your Lordship that this particular case definitely required plausibility because there was a medical use involved, um, and, and that is well established. We say that plausibility is still required for non-medical use claims, particularly of the type of claim we have in this patent. And I'll is, show you all is, is it your submission, but it's always needed yes. for priority? Yes. In, in every type of claim? In every type of claim. There, there, there may be some claims where um, uh, it, it, it's so... Um, yes, I, 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 I certainly say it, it's required in the type of claim before your Lordship today, yes. uh, and medical use claims. It may be there are, my learned friend, think of a claim that doesn't... It's so, it's so obvious on its face that it works, that you don't need a separate plausibility requirement. But we would say there's still a plausibility hurdle inbuilt, and it may be that it's immediately answered by the type of claim in question, a, a claim to a widget of, of a certain type. But um, certainly in this case, which is a Marcouche claim, where there is a class of compounds um, uh, 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 claimed with different linkers and different labels on, etc., we say that this is a requirement, particularly the way that the judge has uh, construe the inventive contribution here and the requirement for stringency which he identifies in the patent. That is a functional requirement which we say has to be plausible both in the priority document and the patent. And the judge found it, that he just cleared the hurdle in the patent because of the experimental data. That data isn't present in the priority document. We say on that basis he shouldn't have found that the priority document was plausible. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, so we'll, we'll yes. Come and, and just before you leave, that, forgive my ignorance. What is a Marcouche claim? So a Marcouche claim is a claim where you you have um, a claim to a chemical, um, but there are various bits of the chemical which are which are defined more loosely. So you can have a, a well, different group. Well, I, I don't think we need to get into that because the truth of the matter is that this is not a Marcouche claim. It, it, it may be said to be analogous, but it's not strictly a Marcouche claim. What um, is? I'm sorry, but it, it certainly is in the in the priority document. Claim one is a more future claim. All right. Okay. But, um, we'll, we'll 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 come come on to that, and and um, uh, it, it maybe it doesn't matter what you, what you call it. Um, we say certainly say that plausibility is a requirement of, of this claim uh, and generally. Um, my lords, I was going to I want to take you to Gembax and just show you what. The, the Board of Appeals said in Gembax, um, so your Lordship is, is aware. Uh, that is at, uh, it's in the second authorities bundle at tab 24. It doesn't matter, but I've got three authorities bundles. I'm at well. the third one. Very fortunate, my lord. I don't know where. Um, maybe they've been double, single side copies, and that's that's. I think. Um, tab twenty-four. That's probably in the it, third bundle. It is. So this, 
this is the gem bass in which, which uh, this is just the first of the most distinguished. And if I can show you the relevant passages, it starts on page 10 of the decision, page 969 of the bundle. And uh, there's a passage right to priority. If your lordship wanted to turn back um, uh, page one of the decision 960 of the bundle, you can see the claim in issue, which was another Swiss form claim, the use of a peptide for the manufacture of medicaments for the treatment of prophylaxis of cancer and various features of the peptide then defined. And uh, so the board starts their analysis of the right to priority at paragraph five. <coughs> in paragraph seven, they point out um, the priority document differs from that of the patent and that it lacks the experimental results contained in paragraph 73 to 77. Um, uh, and then they summarize the argument of appellant two in paragraph eight uh, that the priority document lacked any experimental data which made it plausible uh, that the invention now claimed worked. So that the attack was a lack of plausibility. Um, and then in 11, uh, they explain, since the enablement of the disclosure of the priority document has explicitly not been challenged by appellant two, the board does not consider it appropriate to doubt that the priority document discloses the claimed invention in an enabling way. And they go on to say, beyond the issue of enablement, the board sees no legal basis for imposing additional criteria, such as the presence of experimental data in the priority document, which make it plausible that the invention would work. The board is furthermore convinced that the experimental data which are present in the patent and not in the priority document do not change the nature of the invention disclosed. So a number of points to make there. Firstly, as the judge in Hospira correctly recorded, enablement was not actually an issue there. Um, and of course, in this case, it is. Um, so that may that's one reason why the board um, didn't uh, may not have felt it necessary to discuss plausibility. Uh, and it, they indeed they expressly say at, at the bottom of page twelve, beyond the issue of enablement, i.e., putting enablement aside, they don't see any requirement uh, to look at plausibility. Um, uh, uh, and that might be right if enablement hasn't been challenged. Um, but in any event, it certainly distinguishes this. Gen back from the present case. And then in 12, they go on to say, um, Pellant 2 submitted that in view of decision uh, 1329 of 04, it would be necessary that the priority document contained experimental data which made plausible that the invention now claimed work. However, said decision is concerned with the question of inventive step and is therefore not relevant for the present issue of entitlement to priority. And they go on uh, to move on to novelty. Uh, and we say that this is characteristic of uh, the way in which the EPO deals with these sorts of issues. Um, they do um, look at this issue, but they tend to look at it under the head of inventive step. They, they salami slice um, uh, the arguments uh, and they put it under that heading. Um, in our submission, the United Kingdom approach is more holistic and uh, plausibility is looked at not just under inventive step, but under grounds of sufficiency uh, and indeed priority as well um, and we say that if priority requirements are that it must be the same invention um, then the questions of plausibility if they're relevant to inventive step they must also be relevant to the question of plausibility because if you're look, asking what is the invention you have to be asking the same question in each case and we say that the only real mistake of the EPO is to um, silo this consideration under inventive step rather than dealing with it uh, under well, priority. In, in this is a step. single decision. What's the current state of the case law in the EPA on this issue? Well, my Lord, we, we, we've been able, we've looked into this, we've only found one other case which cites Gembax and it merely records what Gembax um, says uh, in, in, in the way that the EPA does. Okay. Um, and, and so we haven't found uh, that the position has advanced um, in the EPO since the Gembax decision was first published in 2007. Um, 
And so that, that's the, the only... My, my learned friend has, has come up with a, another authority um, uh, over the weekend, which I, I will address your Lordship Don uh, briefly. And we say that is consistent with what I've just explained to your Lordship, which is that the EPO tends to look at this under the head of inventive step rather than priority. But it, in the end, it all comes down to the same question. What is the invention? And is that invention plausibly disclosed, <coughs> whether it be in the priority document or the patent? So well, I'll, I'll come to that um, after I've looked, if I may, at uh, Warner Lambert, because we say that's the, the leading case on, on this topic in uh, the United Kingdom, at least. Um, and there is uh, quite a lot of guidance in that. Um, which supports the position that we adopt uh, in this appeal. So, my lord, that's back at tab 16, which may be in tab bundle 2 or maybe bundle 3 of my lord's. <coughs> this up at paragraph 17. Uh, this is the uh, opinion of Lord Sumption, uh, where he <coughs> begins with uh, dealing with the question of sufficiency and plausibility. And uh, if your lordships will perhaps just read to yourselves, remind yourselves of the contents of paragraph 17. Um, and he, in that context, he says uh, towards the end of that paragraph, 
if sections 14.3 and 72.1c are read literally and as an exhaustive statement of the requirement of sufficiency, all that needs to be disclosed is the new purpose, which is enough to enable it to be administered to a patient suffering from the relevant condition. The skilled person does not need to know how or why the invention worked in order to replicate it. The result would be that the knowledge which made the identification of the whole of the new purpose inventive need not be disclosed at all. So this is dealing with Swiss form claims, but asking the question, well, do you need to make them plausible, or can you just say drug X for treatment of condition Y, and that's good enough because you can just try it by putting it into a patient. Uh, and he goes on to reject that latter argument, and he says in 20, the main problem about this result is that it would enable a patent to be obtained on a wholly speculative basis. Without some disclosure of how or why the known product can be expected to work in the new application, it would be possible to patent the manufacture of known compounds for the purpose of treating every conceivable relevant condition without having invented anything at all, in the hope that trial and error might in due course show that the product was efficacious in treating at least some of them. And he then goes on uh, to refer to the judgments below um, and the Court of Appeal, in indeed, in their paragraph 46, referred to uh, the desire to prohibit <coughs> speculative claiming, which would otherwise allow the armchair inventor a monopoly over a field of endeavour. And on the Court of Appeal's analysis, what was needed is at the last line of the page, a reasonable, credible theory as to why the invention will or might work. Um, the judge then set out the arguments before him, um, uh, and the primary argument was that it was an impermissible addition uh, that we see summarised at the beginning of 21. Um, alternatively, uh, uh, he said that it should be highly qualified um, uh, and uh, therefore wouldn't, shouldn't have applied in the present case, and we see that in the second half of, of 21. Um, 22, uh, Lord Sumption goes on to discuss armchair inventors uh, a little more. Um, and then he goes on in the middle of 22, he says, in reality, however, speculative claiming of this kind is simply one of a number of ways in which a patentee may attempt to claim a monopoly more extensive than anything which is justified by his contribution to the art. And he goes on to give some examples. Um, and at the end of 22, he says, but the claim will still exceed his contribution to the art if that contribution is not sufficiently disclosed in the patent. Um, he then introduces the concept of plausibility in 23, and he explains the concept of plausibility originates in the case law of the EPO as a response to overboard claims, in particular claims to whole classes of chemical compounds supported by a description which fails to show which compounds can be expected to work. Um, and he says this is all part of the overall broader question of whether the what is disclosed is commensurate with the monopoly claimed under EPC Article 46, 56 in the concept of inventive step. And he goes on to introduce the um, Agrivo principle at the bottom of uh, the page. Uh, and he explains that in the last line. It imports a requirement that the patent should disclose not just that the invention is and how to replicate it, but some reason for expecting that it will work. Plausibility was the standard to which the patentee was expected to demonstrate this. Uh, and we say this is this is a particular relevance to the present case. And it shows that um, this requirement for plausibility is not just limited to Swiss claims, but it also applies to claims uh, to chemical compounds as well. Uh, then he recites from Johns Hopkins um, in 24, uh, which we say is, is still good law, that post filed evidence may not serve as the sole basis to establish that the application has solved the problem. Then he goes on in 25 to deal with English law, and he refers to Biogen uh, and Lord Hoffman's reliance on Exxon, the quote from Exxon, which we've already seen, that's on page 756. Um, uh, and he points out uh, just below the quote uh, at the bottom half of 75, page 756, he says, Lord Hoffman was not in these observations addressing the question of second use patents. And that's right. Um, and we say that's uh, uh, just goes to show that Lord Hoffman's reasoning um, and his reliance on the principle that the extent of the monopoly must not exceed the technical contribution applies not just to Swiss form claims, but all claims uh, in general, including those in the present case. Um, Lord
Board Assumption then goes on to discuss first form claims in more detail in 26, but he points out that um, uh, the, re the uh, jurisprudence for first form claims didn't start in that field, and it started in the non-medical field. Um, this is the, sec the first full sentence on page 757. This proposition was originally established in purpose-limited patents for non-medical uses. He refers to Mobile and Bayer. Um, and then perhaps if your lordships would just remind yourselves of the quote um, uh, from uh, Bayer in paragraph 26, uh, which he refers to, we say that is uh, applicable to all, all types of claims. in the present case, we say that the judge has um, implied a particular technical effect into the claims in issue. Um, and by doing that, um, it is therefore necessary to show that the claims actually achieve uh, that particular effect, both in the pri priority document and in the patent in suit. And that's where we say that the priority document falls down and why it is not plausible. Um, then uh, Lord Assumption goes on to discuss some of the English law in more detail, he refers to Prendergast, then he goes to Salt of 28. Um, uh, and uh, if we can pick it up at paragraph 30, which is where he goes on to say, well, having decided that the principle does apply, he goes on to discuss what the threshold is. Um, uh, and uh, he rejects the argument uh, that. Um, threshold is, well, it, it has to be inherently implausible for you to hold that the patent is not supported. He says that's too high threshold. Um, it's the wrong way round. Um, uh, and it, it would be wrong to only reject claims where the skilled person would be sceptical about um, uh, the technical effect. And he says, um, perhaps we just pick it up in the last uh, six lines of paragraph 30, he says, um, it would be inconsistent with the reason why plausibility of the claim therapeutic effect is required, namely to support the implied claim for therapeutic efficacy and to justify the monopoly by reference to the patentee's contribution to the art. If Warner Lambert's argument was sound, it would mean that nothing, that if nothing was known, either for or against the claim therapeutic effect, no disclosure need be made in support of it. He says that that is um, putting it, uh, it, it, it too low. Um, he then goes on to refer to review a number of the the further EPO cases, and he comes to his conclusions really on the principles in paragraphs 36 and 37. Um, uh, and uh, he sets out the Court of Appeals uh, conclusion at the beginning of 36. He says they consider that the threshold was not only low, but that the test could be satisfied by a prediction based on the slimmest of evidence, or one based on material which was manifestly incomplete. Um, uh, uh, and he, he says uh, they consider salt. I respectfully disagree. The principle is that the specification must disclose some reason for supposing that the implied assertion of efficacy in the claim is true. And he goes on to say that plausibility isn't a distinct condition, um, but he says uh, in the last two sentences, it cannot be deprived of all meaning or reduced, as Floyd, Lord Justice Floyd's statement does, to little more than a test of good faith. Indeed, if the threshold were as low as he suggests, it would be unlikely to serve even the limited purpose that he assigns it uh, of barring speculative or armchair claims. Uh, and so he goes to, on to set out um, what he says the principles are in 37, um, uh, which will perhaps be familiar to your lordships. Um, uh, and in particular, we uh, highlight the second of his principles. Um, it's not made plausible by a bare assertion to that effect. Um, and then uh, a little further down, uh, he says, um, uh, there mustn't just be an abstract possibility that it would work, but because reasonable scientific grounds were disclosed for expecting that it might well work, the disclosure of those grounds marks the difference between a speculation and a contribution to the art. This is in substance what the Technical Board of Appeal has held in the context of Article 56. So again, we see the cross-reference to the Technical Board's approach under Inventive Step. Um, when assessing the efficiency of disclosure made in support of claims extending beyond the teaching of the patent. In my opinion, there is no reason to apply a lower standard of plausibility when the sufficiency of disclosure arises in the context of Articles uh, 
83 and 84, and their analogues in Section 14 of the Patents Act. In both contexts, the, text, the test has the same pur purpose. Um, uh, then he goes on to say, uh, fourth, uh, the disclosure need not def definitively prove the assertion, but there must be something which would cause the skilled person to think that there was a reasonable prospect that the assertion would prove to be true. Uh, fifth, he refers to the direct effect on a metabolic mechanism. Um, uh, then he goes on to say, sixth, it need not necessarily be demonstrated by experimental data. It can be demonstrated by a priori reasoning. For example, and this is no more than the example, <coughs> the specification may point to some property of the product which would lead the skilled person to expect that it might well produce the claimed therapeutic effect or some unifying principle that relates to the product or the proposed use. Um, finally, seventh, he says, sufficiency is a characteristic of the disclosure and these matters must appear from the patent. The disclosure may be supplemented or explained by the common general knowledge. It is not enough that the patentee can prove that the product can reasonably be expected to work in a designated use if the skilled person would not derive this from the teaching of the patent. And we say if these principles are applied to the prior document in the present case, then it can be shown that on the judge's assessment of the inventive contribution, the technical contribution, um, uh, the, the test is not satisfied and he ought to have held that uh, priority uh, was absent. Well, as I said I would deal with my learned friend's additional case, and I think it's convenient to deal with it now. So um, he, he's added a case to the bun bundle, I think you'll find it at uh, tab 25A, <coughs> to further EPO decisions. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, we, we anticipate what he's going to say about this is that um, there is some distinction between types of claim for the purposes of priority, and in particular, product claims and method claims can be distinguished, um, uh, uh, and therefore uh, the principles which I've been showing in order don't apply to at least some of the claims um, in my own friend's patents. Now, well, well as we say. There's no basis for this argument, either as a matter of law or based upon the way that the case has been run below um, before the judge um, and indeed before your lordships on this appeal. So if I can turn to the law first of all and deal with um, uh, the point on the law, uh, it's a decision of, of uh, the Board of Appeal T161609 uh, and your lordships will see the type of claim and issue in that case um, set out on page one of the decision uh, in paragraph three. You'll see it's a right at the bottom of the page uh, a pharmaceutical composition comprising a DNA methylation inhibitor and an anti neoplastic agent whose activity as an anti neoplastic agent in vivo is adversely affected by a derivative. DNA methylation. Um, if we then turn on to, uh, uh, and this was a, an appeal um, from a decision of the examination division, um, uh, rejecting uh, these claims um, uh, on uh, the grounds of sufficiency. Um, so it was an ex parte appeal, uh, only one side represented. Um, and, and we turn on to the reasons begin on uh, page five. Um, and uh, you'll see that the heading main request article 83, that's sufficiency. And if you pick it up at paragraph 5, um, the board say, the present main request comprises product claims directed to pharmaceutical compositions as well as claims directed to medical uses in the format of either purpose-restricted product claims or Swiss-type medical use claims. So there are two types of claim in issue here. Pharmaceutical composition claim, uh, and uh, uh, and also a, a, a Swiss type claim with a um, medical use in. What they say in six is clearly the level of disclosure which is required for these different categories of claims is not the same. Um, and they go on uh, at the top of the following page um, in reference to the uh, pharmaceutical compositions. They say it's in principle sufficient that the application provides information which allows the skilled person to produce the composition or kit, and that there are no substantiated doubts that it could indeed be used in therapy. So there is still a requirement 
uh, for plausibility. It still has to be plausible that the kit can be used in therapy. It is just directed to a slightly different purpose uh, than the uh, Swiss claims, which have a, uh, an express uh, medical use attached to them. Um, then they go on to look, first of all, at the composition claims in paragraph 6. Um, they identify the claim in, in the first lines of paragraph 6, and then they go on about five lines down. They say, as an example of DNA methylation inhibitors, and they refer to some analogues that are referred to in the specification. And then just level with the bottom hole punch, they say, the application also provides a long list of available anti-neoplastic agents, so both types of um, products that are referred to are listed in the application. And they say in the last four lines, there's no reason to doubt that such products could be formulated as pharmaceutical compositions, since they were in, indeed individually available in the prior art as such, and had also been used in combination. The board thus considers that the application is filed, in particular the description, contains sufficient information to enable the skilled person to produce the pharmaceutical compositions as claimed. They then go on to deal with the examination division's arguments based on lack of plausibility in 6.12. And they say, the arguments of the examination division were based on, um, perhaps it's rather me reading out, perhaps your lordship just read 6.12, um, and I'll make a couple of comments on it. reference in the, in the specification to there being a synergistic um, improvement uh, of the effectiveness of, of the anti-neoplastic agent. Um, and uh, what the board held in 6.12 is that it wasn't necessary for the purpose of sufficiency um, to require this to be a feature of the claim. Um, and they said uh, <clears throat> effectively that the claims were self-limited by the functional features in them of the anti-neoplastic um, uh, uh, requirement in the case of one of the agents and the uh, um, uh, the other the other the other feature was the um, sorry the DNA methylation inhibitor being the other one um, uh, and if you can test for those and test that your two ingredients have those um, required features, uh, then that's good enough to satisfy um, the sufficiency requirements of the claim. So that, that, was, that was their decision. Um, and uh, uh, they then go on, and we say there was, there was still a, an element of plausibility required, and that's the one we refer to in uh, paragraph 6. But they were unwilling to read the requirement for synergy, synergy into the claim as well at this stage. Um, they then go on to determine the claims on medical uses, um, and they said the same thing in paragraph 6.23 about the requirement of synergy. Um, and they say, uh, the arguments of the examining division concerning an improvement of synergistic effect are also not valid for these claims, as these claims, that is the medical use claims, do not require such an effect. Such an argument could be relevant in the discussion of inventive step, but not of sufficiency of disclosure. Um, and so, in our submission, this echoes um, uh, Lord Sumption's observations, and indeed the observations I, I've shown you in some of the other cases, that the EPO tend to deal with this plausibility requirement under the heading of inventive step, not sufficiency. And indeed, what happened in this case was that the patent was remitted to the examination division for it to look at the question of inventive step, which it hadn't yet done. And indeed, the patent was refused for lack of inventive step, um, a, a, and the application um, was withdrawn. The, the examination division indicated they were going to refuse it, and the application was withdrawn. And indeed, 
that you can go even further, and there's a divisional application which was eventually granted containing some um, uh, limit on the amount of each drug to be given, but even that didn't contain any um, uh, pharmaceutical composition claims, and we say that's because such claims um, would not have been plausible um, uh, based on uh, the approach the EPO takes to inventive step. So, my lords, we say this claim, this, this case doesn't support my learned friend's submissions. It shows that there is a consistent approach across all types of claim, uh, um, whether it's determined under inventive step or um, more holistically, as Mr. we say. Richardson, I'm a bit mystified as to where all of this interesting debate over the law is going. Correct me if I've misunderstood, but as I read the judgment, the judge has not held that plausibility of the claims is not required as a matter of law. On the contrary, he's proceeded on the basis that as a matter of law, plausibility is required, and he says on the facts that standard is satisfied. My Lord, that's right. And there is no respondent's notice saying that plausibility is not required as a matter of law. My Lord, correct. And that is that was the second point I was going to make about why my learned friend can't start to try to divide up these claims and say, oh, well, some of these claims are product claims, <coughs> and they may, be, uh, may not have a requirement for plausibility. Uh, as your Lordship correctly points out, that point wasn't made below. There's no response notice now. And so even if there were anything in my learned friend's attempt to raise this point as a matter of law, which we say there isn't, we say it's not open to him to, to, to run the point now. So perhaps I should just move on um, with those observations and see what my learned friend tries to make of that case. But, but um, I respectfully agree with your Lordship. Your the judge did deal with it on the, the head of plausibility, and we say um, we say he was right to do so. He just got the facts wrong. Um, or he, he was inconsistent in his approach um, uh, uh, on that basis. Well, I, did, I suppose the only other point to, to, to try to deal with is, just, is, is the type of claim that um, we have in, in issue here and how plausibility plays out in that type of claim. Um, and uh, your lordships will be familiar with, with the type of claim from the judgment. So, uh, um, perhaps we can, uh, we can turn to the judgment now. And then there's one more point I need to make on the law before I come on to the judgment. <coughs> detail. Uh, it's a, the, the claims are set out at the back of the judgment. <coughs> and it's so at page 187 uh, of the bundle, tab 6. And uh, seen this already, so claim one, for instance, this is a modified nucleotide molecule comprising a purine or pyrimidine base, and a ribose or deoxyribose sugar moiety, um, etc., uh, and, and uh, wherein Z in the molecule is an azido-methyl group. Um, and then your Lordship will see claim two, a mo molecule according to claim one, wherein said base is linked to a detectable label via a people link or or a non cleavable linker, etc., etc. So, um, your Lordship, perhaps, when, when your Lordship put to me, oh, it's not a Marcouche, your Lordship was perhaps referring to the fact that most of the Marcouche bit of claim one has been crossed out now. The, the point I was trying to make is that claim one is not to a single chemical, it is to a group of chemicals. It's a class of chemicals. It's a class of chemicals. Yeah, yeah that, that's the, that, so, so perhaps that's a more accurate way I should, should have described it like that rather than using the term Mark Cooch, but certainly um, we say for the purposes of, of this case, class of chemicals plain, and of course that um, brings with it uh, the requirements of Igrivo, that is to say um, all of the class of, of, that, uh, of those chemicals must share any advantageous properties um, that are uh, claimed Otherwise, they would be mere chemical compounds and would be obvious on that basis. And if I just, I know Lord Justice Arnold is 
very familiar with this principle, but if I can just um, refer you briefly to uh, the Idenix decision, um, which is in tab 13 of uh, the bundles. and it contains a convenient summary of the law um, in relation to the Agrivo principles. And if I just highlight the relevant passages, firstly at tab 13, page uh, 507 of the bundle, and it's paragraph 304, um, your Lordship uh, set out, referred to the compound claims, um, and you said that uh, in some cases such claims are to be construed simply as those compounds. Then in 305 you go on to say, nevertheless there are some cases in which the specification makes it clear to the skilled reader that even though the claims are expressed as pure compound claims, it was not the inventor's intention to claim the compounds in the abstract and without reference to their intended use. And you go on <coughs> to refer to pharmacia um, uh, at some length. And then uh, you uh, note in paragraph 306 that in the present case, it was agreed that the validity of claims 1, 2, and 5 could be assessed on the basis they were to be construed as pure compound claims, or not as pure compound claims, but as comp rather as claims to compounds which had anti-sliverized activity. And then you went on to deal with this in a bit more detail um, in a passage beginning on page 533 of the uh, bundle, paragraph 426 onwards. Um, and, and this is the um, allegation that there is uh, no technical contribution. Uh, and you summarize the law, first of all, 427 onwards refer to Agrivo. And then in 429, you uh, um, put what the board said, uh, quote what the board said, um, if the claim compounds were to be assumed not to have any technically useful property, then it could be postulated that the technical problem which is solved by the claim compounds would be the minimalist one in such a situation namely the mere provision of further or alternative chemical compounds as such, regardless of their likely useful properties. Um, and then you went on to point out that the applicant argued that that was wrong um, and that at the <coughs> end of 4.30, uh, the applicant, or halfway through 4.30, the applicant argued that even on the basis of known starting compounds and known synthetic methods, the skilled person would have faced an unlimited number of possibilities for solving this problem and that a particular selection from that unlimited number was inventive, even if it was arbitrary, unless there was a direct pointer to the preparation of these particular compounds in the prior art. The board rejected this argument for the following reasons. Um, and you set out uh, the decision of the board there, um, uh, and in particular, uh, the second sentence of paragraph 2.53, if this result is only to be seen in obtaining further chemical compounds, then all known chemical compounds are equally suitable as the starting point for structural modification, and no inventive skill needs to be exercised in selecting, for instance, the compound of formula um, uh, uh, 14. Um, uh, and then it's the, the familiar passage at the end of that paragraph. Uh, the board holds that in view of the underlying general principle set out in Pat point 2.4.2 point above, the selection of such compounds in order to be patentable must not be arbitrary but must be justified by a hitherto <coughs> unknown technical effect which is caused by those structural features which distinguish the claimed compounds from the numerous other compounds. It follows directly from these considerations that a technical effect which justifies the selection of the claimed compounds must be one which we can, can be fairly assumed to be produced by substantially all the selected compounds. And so, so just pausing there, this is really a, 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 an answer to my Lord, Lord, Nugis, Lord Justice Nugis' question that when you have a class of chemicals there has to be a technical effect which is common to that class, otherwise you are merely creating new chemicals which um, would be said to be obvious uh, and lacking in technical benefit. And so that, that's why we say this principle of 
um, reading in the, the technical benefit applies just as much to chemical comp a, a claim to chemical compounds as it would to a claim to a medical use. You have to show that the technical effect is plausible in order for that claim to be supported. Uh, and that's where we say the judge went wrong in, in this case on the priority document. Can I just be sure I understand that? The, the claim itself, as you show us, is claims one and two, is, is just to a compound. Yes. Or rather, a group of compounds. Yes. And, and it's, the, it's the claim which you get the patent for. You, you don't get the patent for the whole specification, is it? It's the claim which is patentable. Well, that's r that's right, my lord. But but, but yeah. you have to read the claim in the light of the specification. Yes. So is it your submission that to understand what the claim is actually claiming monopoly for, that it's you read words into the claim, or is it yes, that, well, that, that you, what you're claiming monopoly for is those compounds? But the reason you are entitled to patent them is found in the specification. Yes, the invention, the invention in this case is not just the identification of the compound. It's the identification of the compounds for the use in SBS technology, sequencing by synthesis technology. And therefore, the disclosure of the invention in the patent, and that's the invention as found by the judge, has to also to be made in the priority document for there to be priority. Uh, and the judge, I'll show you, plainly f held that what the claims disclosed was not just a mere chemical, but it was a chemical having the characteristics of the specification of paragraphs four and five of the patent. And, and, and that's it was one that could be used for, as, a, as a reversible chain. Yes, it had, had various SPS. characteristics. It, it was stable, long, had long-term stability. It was uh, efficiently uh, uh, added, efficiently removed, allowed further bases to be added. So all of these features were read by the judge into the invention. And whether he was right or wrong about that, I don't, I don't mind for the purposes of the priority analysis. What he failed to do was then analyze the priority document with this, these features in mind, when it was clear that he had read those features into the claim for the purposes of inventive step. And we say there was an error there. He, he, was, in, he was entitled to, to read them in. If, on, his, on his judgment, he was entitled to read them in for the purposes of inventive step, because he said, this is what the contribution is. And I'm going to see if this contribution is obvious from the prior art, and he held it wasn't. But having defined the inventive contribution in that way, he ought to have applied the same inventive contribution to his analysis of the priority document. And that's where we say he, he fell down. Now, I, I accept that in, in, at the trial, we said that the contribution was less than the judge held it to be. So we said the invention was smaller. And that was why um, uh, uh, we, we pushed the obviousness end of the seesaw, perhaps harder at um, uh, 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 trial. Um, but, um, uh, but once you have built in those additional features to the invention, as the judge did, um, that's, he then used that to decide that the claim was not obvious. He ought to have also borne them in mind in relation to priority, and we say he didn't. I'm sorry to be so slow about this. In a Swiss use claim, you say compound X for use in Y. Yes. For use in some therapeutic benefit. That's written into the claim. So, so that if you, you're only infringing the claim if, if you're using compound X for that use. If you use compound X for some other use, you're not infringing it. Yes, uh, the, 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 the law is still a little unclear on that, but I, right. that's, that's a, a reasonable assumption for the purpose right. of the discussion. Now, I think what you were saying is, is that, in effect, that's what the claim here is. It's, it's a compound for a particular purpose, but I'm not sure that is what you're saying. I think what you're saying is the claim is the compound, but the reason you get a patent monopoly for the claim is because it does actually constituted a technical contribution. Is that right? That's right. And, and, and you, you, you have to have an invention, um, and, and that gives you a, a valid claim. And, and in some cases, regardless of the precise form of the claim, you read certain features into that claim which are not expressly there. And a, a, a class of compound 
um, claim, class of compounds claim, is one such claim, just as a, a, a Swiss form claim might be at one such claim where you read in actual efficacy. And, and this is what I was, I was showing you, Lord. So yeah. in the Grivo, there was a class of compounds that were claimed, as, um, and the specification said they were herbicides, but the requirement to be a herbicide wasn't in the claim. And the Board of Appeals said, we need to imply this herbicide requirement into the claim. Otherwise, all you're doing is just listing chemical compounds. And if you list chemical compounds, that's, that's anyone can sit and write out chemical compounds. Anyone can file a patent for that. There's no, you haven't contributed anything to the art by writing down some, some chemical compounds. So the board said you have to imply this requirement to be a herbicide into the claim. And, and if you can't show that all of the compounds in the claim have the herbicidal feature, then it lacks inventive step because some of the compounds are arbitrary and lack the technical contribution. And so in the Gilead case, um, my Lord, Lord Justice, Justice Arnold, well, it wasn't in dispute that the claims required the technical contribution, even though they were written as pure compound claims. But that was merely an application of this well-established principle that if you have a, a claim to a group of chemical compounds, it needs to be to have a technical effect in order to be non-obvious because otherwise you're, you're merely encouraging people to file patents with every chemical under the sun written out, and, and which today could be easily done um, uh, using electronic devices, etc. So um, the idea is to stop these types of patents being filed and, and blocking the system by requiring that there is a technical contribution which is present across the breadth of the claim, substantially all the, the selected compounds having it. Uh, and so that's why we say that the, the, the plausibility point is equally uh, applicable to uh, compound claims as it is to medical use claims. Um, well, I, was, I, 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 hope, I hope that's helped um, your, your Lordship. So, this, my Lord, Mr Justice Arnold, as you then were, set out further passages from the Griever at 432. Um, you then referred to Johns Hopkins at, at 433 and some of the English authorities, including Connor. And then finally, at 442, uh, you summarise the principles from uh, Lord Justice Floyd uh, in uh, Generics and Yeda. And then you uh, came to your application of these principles to the facts of the Gilead case in 445. Um, and uh, you determined... Secondly, for the reasons explained above, it's common ground that so far as the compound claims are concerned, inventive steps should be assessed not on the basis that they are pure compound claims, but rather on the basis that they are claims to compounds which have anti activity. activity. If it were otherwise, these claims would lack inventive step on the basis that the only technical problem they solved was the provision of additional alternative nucleoside analogues. And that, we say, is precisely what the judge has done in the present case, he's read in the requirements of paragraphs four and five of the patent into all of the claims, um, and he has said uh, that uh, they are not obvious because um, uh, the prior art didn't enable the skilled person without inventive step to reach the same conclusion that the azido methyl group would have all these particular uh, features. Um, but having done that, he then needs to apply this same inventive concept to the requirements for priority, the requirement for it to be the same invention disclosed in the priority document. And he failed to do that for the reasons which I'm now going to come on and show you. So, my lords, I'm sorry for the slightly lengthy um, traverse through the authorities. I'm now going to go to the judgment and show you um, the relevant parts of the judgment on priority and, and where the judge went wrong. So we're at tab six uh, of the core bundle. And um, as your lordships will know, it's a substantial piece of work from the judge. Um, I haven't got the time, and it would be a little point in me reading out uh, lengthy passages. So I'm going to assume that your lordships already have familiar familiarity with the judgment and uh, try to confine myself to the um, salient points only. Um, Firstly, just um, 
starting at, at the beginning, uh, the priority date is of, of the second priority document is the 23rd of December 2002. The judge records that in paragraph 2. Um, then skipping on to the technical background, that starts at paragraph 39. Um, and the judge sets out some of the uh, relevant background in 44 onwards. And your lordships will see the uh, little figure showing um, Sanger sequencing. This was the, the prior art in, in, in prior art method of sequencing DNA in 44. And as your lordships will see, in a Sanger technique, um, uh, what you do is you have numerous strands of different lengths, um, and each of the strands is terminated with uh, a specific base. Um, and uh, you can read off the length of the strand by reference to the base which has terminated it. So if you look at the very top uh, 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 line of DNA in, in um, the figure, you'll see the end is an A, that's the longest piece of DNA, and then the one below, the end is a C, that's the next longest piece on the gel. And so by putting all this together, um, you can recreate the sequence strand by strand. Um, uh, but that involves each of the strands being terminated and, and repetitive uh, sequencing in, in, in that way uh, and running out on the gel. Um, oh. And so the judge goes on to introduce um, the technique of sequencing by synthesis in paragraph 47 uh, and uh, sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators in paragraph 48. Um, and he contrasts this with the Sanger technique, and the Sanger technique where each sequence gets blocked when you put the terminator on. In the technique using reversible chain terminators, you can terminate, identify um, uh, the base, and then you can reverse the termination and add another base um, and sequence the same strand in, in a um, uh, repetitive way in that way, and that avoids um, some of the difficulties that the Sanger uh, technique um, uh, in includes. Um, then the judge at uh, 53, uh, he starts to summarise the dispute between the parties on the identity of the addressee of the patent, which turned in part on the characterisation of the common general knowledge about which there was a significant dispute. Uh, and the dispute at trial was whether the skilled person would have been aware of this technique of sequencing by synthesis using reversible chain terminators um, from the common general knowledge. And as the judge explained, if the skilled person uh, wasn't aware of this technique from the common general knowledge, um, then the, it would have been difficult to get the obviousness case off the ground at all. Um, but he found that the skilled person was aware of this technique in general. And this he dealt with um, at paragraphs 92 to 96. Um, and, and perhaps I could just ask your lordships to remind yourselves of, of, of 92 to 96. Um, and I'll just make a couple of observations. So um, the judge held that uh, the skilled, relevant skill team was a team working on research into sequencing by synthesis, 
He'd held over the wide range of such groups interested in and looking directly at this area at the time, um, but he also noted it had not succeeded yet, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but certainly, uh, the skilled reader of the patents of the priority document knew about the technique um, uh, at large. Um, the common general knowledge section begins at paragraph 101, um, uh, and the judge uh, starts to deal with the facts at 103 onwards. Um, 104, uh, he records that the skilled team would be uh, aware, well aware of pyro sequencing. Um, but he says, in my judgment, the common general knowledge would also include knowledge of the concept of reversible chain termination. That's consistent with his finding on the skilled team. Um, and he refers to a number of papers and a number of groups. Um, and in particular, he says, two-thirds of the way down, 104, he says, again, unprompted, the common general knowledge would include the existence of two particular papers which were frequently cited. They, they are Metzger 1994 and Canard 1994. Um, and uh, he, he goes on to say, what was common general knowledge? These papers existed, published results, and represented the farthest anyone had got with reversible chain terminated as a concept. Um, he then goes on to look at those papers in a bit more detail in, in paragraphs 108 to 109, uh, and those are important because they inform um, the skilled person's attitude to reversible chain terminators at the priority date. Um, in particular, uh, at 108, in relation to the Metzger paper, first of all, um, he records that the authors of that paper reported uh, that they had used a 2 nitrobenzyl protecting group on the 3 prime oxygen. They were able to cleave it off photolytically. Uh, they were also able to incorporate a further nucleotide into the chain in that case, albeit the nucleotide added was a natural one rather than a modified one. In other words, Metzger 1994 achieve, achieved a single cycle of deprotection and reinitiation of DNA synthesis using the uh, 3 prime 2 nitrobenzyl group. And, and that's a, we um, accept that's an accurate description of what Metzger disclosed. Um, and of course, the difference between Metzger and the patent is that the patent uses the azido-methyl group rather than the nitrobenzyl group. Uh, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail uh, a little later. Um, 109, uh, the judge uh, summarized it. Professor Mark summarized Metzger reporting a full cycle of incorporation, deprotection, and reinitiation of DNA synthesis for the 3 prime 2 nitrobenzyl block nucleotides. I accept that, subject to the qualification that the subsequent incorporation was of a natural DNTP. So what the judge is saying there, in other words, Metzger did not put the, the 2 nitrobenzyl on again the second time. They put an, a natural base on the second time um, for that. Um, uh, uh, was understood to show that the, the um, strand had been deblocked and a further base could be added to it. Then uh, 111, uh, the judge refers to the Canard paper, um, uh, and uh, this involves a different blocking <coughs> group, um, uh, but about two thirds of the way through 111, he records um, a single cycle of incorporation was reported. The method was said to work with three more DNA polymerases, albeit the data was not shown for those. The fact that data was not shown in that era of scientific publication before the ready availability of further data via the internet does not mean a skilled person would simply ignore what was said. So again, the, the Canard paper showing um, the single cycle of incorporation uh, and uh, referring to different polymerases. Um, so he goes on having uh, made those observations about the papers, those uh, which were uh, he said known. He summarises from 118 onwards um, the evidence as a whole about the state of reversible chain terminators in the common general knowledge. Um, uh, and uh, he, he summarises submissions in 119. Um, and he says in 120 uh, that um, uh, neither, the end of 120, neither Metzger nor Canard achieved anything more than an initial incorporation in 1994, and their later efforts up to 1999 had not succeeded. Um, uh, that's right, but of course, subject to the qualification as the judge had observed a few paragraphs earlier, 
in the case of the Metzger paper, it wasn't just an initial incorporation and deprotection, but it was also the addition of a further natural base. So there was a further round of addition, albeit the natural base uh, in the Metzger paper. Um, one to one, um, the judge uh, talks about the problem to be solved. Um, uh, and he finds at the end of one to one, he says, um, his approach was that the skilled person looks at Zabdorodny, that's the prior art, with a specific aim of, in mind of finding a blocking group that he might be able to use in a reversible chain terminator sequencing process. That's a reference to Professor Mark, who was our expert. And he says, moreover, the questions put to Professor Ledley were on essentially the same premise that the skilled person came to the cited art interested in taking forward sequencing by synthesis with a new reversible chain terminator. Now, I, I don't accept that. We don't accept that. Um, observation uh, at the end in brackets at the end of one two one. I'll come back to that uh, uh, under the head of obviousness, but I just wanted to note it as in passing um, uh, as we go through. Uh, uh, in one two two, uh, he records that uh, the idea of pursuing new chemical groups um, uh, was, on his finding, not part of the common general knowledge, not representative. Um, uh, and he gives some reasons for that. Um, and then his summary is really in 126. And perhaps your lordships would just remind yourself of what he said in 126 on the common general knowledge. as far as the judge was concerned was a system which could repeatedly incorporate nucleotides in a reversible way but he found that the skilled person did not know with any degree of specificity what particular problem or problems had to be solved um, and as far as the skilled person was concerned the technique simply um, it might be the sim technique simply could not be made to work their attitude was not an upbeat one and we say um, that uh, when he came to look at the priority document, he did not um, remind himself appropriately of the characteristics of the common general knowledge and the skilled person that he summarized in 126. And if he had done, he would not have found um, that uh, the invention was plausibly uh, and disclosed or in an enabling way in the priority document because of the findings that he'd reached on common general knowledge. Now, I don't think it's controversial. Um, but for the avoidance of doubt, when he says in a reversible way, if you read the language literally, you might think he's talking about reversing the incorporation of the nucleotides. And that, of course, is not what he means. What he means is that the blocking at each step is reversible. Yes, I don't think that's in dispute. Yeah. I'm certainly not, not suggesting otherwise. So, well, that's the common general knowledge. Um, the judge then goes on to look at the specifications of the and I'm going to take you to that next because um, we do contrast the judge's findings in relation to the specification of the patents with his approach to the priority document. So um, the patents, uh, he starts at 131, um, and at 133, he sets out paragraph 4 um, from the 289 specification, um, uh, and uh, he sets out um, the uh, five particular features in uh, paragraph four, uh, accurate sequencing, uh, appropriate label, blocking group must be removable, um, and don't, in don't interfere with the integrity of the DNA, um, uh, the sequence of cycle can then continue with the incorporation of the next blocking group, and then in five, in order to be a practical use, the entire process should consist of high yielding, highly specific chemical and enzymatic steps to facilitate multiple cycle sequencing. And he then goes on to set out paragraph 5 in 134, 
and the blocking group has to is said to have to have exhibit long-term <coughs> stability, be efficiently incorporated, cause total blocking of secondary or further incorporation, and the ability to be removed under mild conditions that do not cause damage. Um, and uh, he refers to these as, or the pattern refers to these as stringent requirements, and we'll see um, the judge referring back to this word stringent later on um, when he concludes that these are all the features that are required by um, uh, uh, the required to be supported by the pattern, and and on his findings were supported um, by the disclosure of the pattern, but not we say um, the disclosure of the priority document. Um, 135, um, uh, yeah, I dealt with that, 136, um, he then goes on to record uh, the Zedo Methyl group is presented as being a group which meets these stringent requirements. Um, he, he notes that the text also discusses other groups as well, but nothing turns on that because the Zedo Methyl is uh, called out as a preferred blocking group. Um, he then goes on in 139. Uh, section of Summit 139 to deal with the um, experiments and what they disclose in the pattern. Um, and uh, he uh, adopts Professor Ledley's diagram showing what was done in the experiments. And, and you logic can see um, uh, the, the figure shows the, the little T um, uh, base with the azido methyl being um, incorporated. And then there's an attempt to find, uh, to, to add another base, um, but that fails because the azido methyl is acting as a blocking group. Um, then uh, it is de-blocked and the azido methyl is uh, removed, and that leaves the chain free for addition of a further base. So that's the, that is um, uh, what Professor Ledley, the way in which he described the experiments. There, there's, um, there are no labels on the, on the lanes of the uh, um, Shown the gels shown in the pattern, so that's why the experts had to get into a debate about what was actually being shown, um, and, and this this is what Professor Ledley uh, how he described it, and, and um, this was accepted. Um, Paragraph one four one, this is where the judge refers to this. He says, Figure five shows the results for compounds twenty four, eighteen, and thirty two. That is to say, C to G, C, and A. Professor Ledley provided an annotated version of the figure below. I agree the skilled reader would see it that way. I was not persuaded by a piece of evidence from Professor Marks that the absence of labelling in the patent meant that any interpretation had to be based on a common general knowledge e expectation that the Zedo methyl would be incorporated. So there was, there was a debate about, well, how do you interpret these gels if there are no labels? And the judge rejected the suggestion from Professor Marks that um, you had to understand uh, the gels on the basis that you, your common general knowledge would tell you that the azido-methyl group would be incorporated. So what the judge is finding there <coughs> is that there was no common general knowledge understanding the azido-methyl would be incorporated. And we say that um, is relevant uh, when it is a priority because um, uh, that, is, that is not made plausible by a uh, priority document and, and the absence of it in the common general knowledge is fatal, we say, uh, to um, support for the claim. Anyway, um, moving on for now, we have uh, the gels are discussed in uh, 143 onwards. And if I just um, take 144, for example, uh, the judge explains the first cycle for compounds 18 and 32 show complete incorporation and deblocking of the modi modified nucleotides. The first cycle for compound 24 shows that there was also incorporation and deblocking. However, it was not complete as there is a faint band at the same position as the hairpin primer band in lane one, indicating that some hairpin primers remained into which no nucleotide had been incorporated. If I can just try and explain that by reference to the figures, you'd all just, just look up at, um, at the middle gel, uh, that is 18, which is the C, C base. Um, you all can see in the first lane, there's a hairpin, um, uh, hairpin lane, there's a, there's a, a, a blob um, at the bottom. In the second and third lanes, that blob is not present because uh, the DNA has had a base added to it, it's therefore heavier, and it moves further up the chain. So that's what the judge is referring to when he says there is incorporation 
and then there's in the fourth lane there is deblocking because you can take uh, the uh, group zero methyl group off and you see the original the, the lane the original uh, weight original level of the gel shown again and what the judge is pointing out in the second sentence in one four four is that you don't have such a clean um, result for the G guanosine base that's um, guanosine that that's it um, you see in the first lane there is the, the hairpin that's the control but you can still see that that um, band in the second and third lanes and so there hasn't been complete incorporation um, and indeed the, the fourth lanes onwards become something of a smudge and are very difficult to interpret um, uh, at all um, the judge then goes on to deal with figure six of the patent which was where there were um, six uh, different rounds of incorporation and deblocking were attempted um, at, and he refers to this um, uh, in uh, 146 onwards um, and uh, in 148 um, he, he explains this um, uh, and, and there's a dispute between the experts as to whether or not the um, all the blurring in the gel was a result of uh, a, a wrong level of radioactivity or whether it showed that actually the um, reactions weren't going to completion um, and he found uh, in favour of Professor Marx's interpretation that that was in fact the likely explanation and at the end of 148 he holds uh, rather they would accept that the second cycle for C and A less so for G and the fourth and later cycles for T were likely to have taken place but may not have been fully efficient and may have involved side reactions. Um, nevertheless, um, in spite of the problems with those later rounds of incorporation, he goes on to hold in 149. However, while I have accepted part of Professor Marx's evidence here at a technical level, I was not persuaded by his view that the contents of the patent did not represent an important or significant development. To characterize the patent as MGI, MGI sometimes did in argument is just showing one more cycle three compared to two cycles shown in the prior, uh, prior to date papers is not realistic and not how, he, how it would be viewed by the skilled person. So it's clear here that um, the judge regarded these experiments as important. Um, they showed an important or significant development um, and they support the uh, references to stringency which the judge had earlier referred to in paragraphs four and five of the patent. Um, uh, and indeed, in, in paragraph 150, um, uh, the judge refers to some cross-examination by my learned friend. Counsel for Illumina put to Professor Marx that this, this experimental data was a significant technical advance in the field of reversible chain termination sequencing. Professor Marx did not accept that because of the quality of the data as summarized above. He was prepared to accept that the third cycle of incorporation of the T nucleotide was a step which had not been shown before but he would not accept it was an important or significant development. This was the least persuasive part of Professor Marx's testimony, and on this topic I'd prefer the evidence of Professor Ledley. So just pausing there, the judge clearly doesn't accept uh, Professor Marx's evidence, and he, uh, on the contrary, found that these experiments uh, showed an important and significant development. And the judge continues, um, Professor Ledley's view was as follows. The data shows that modified nucleotides with a 3 primazidyl methyl blocking group may be used for controlled, one at a time, incorporation of nucleotides into a polynucleotide. The 3 azido methyl modified nucleotides were incorporated by the polymerase resulting in chain termination. The blocking group and fluorescent label are capable of being removed using a water-soluble phosphine to regenerate the 3 prime hydroxyl, allowing further rounds of incorporation of 3 prime blocked nucleotides in a stepwise manner. I accept this evidence. So um, there, the judge making clear that he thought what was important here was the demonstration by experimental evidence, including data, that the blocking group and the label can be removed uh, and regenerated, and further rounds uh, of incorporation can take place. Uh, and so in 151, um, he holds, in terms of efficiency based on Professor Ledley's evidence, I find that the skilled person taking the patent as a whole, including these figures five and six, would conclude that while further optimization of the conditions was likely to be required, 
they would expect it to amount to routine work. They would regard the data as showing that the incorporation and deblocking steps were sufficiently efficient to be a promising repeatable technique. And he goes on to find that that would be routine work. And in 152, he summarizes, overall, the skilled person reading the patent as a whole and taking into account the experimental results would accept as plausible the proposition that a nucleotide with a three prime azido methyl blocking group satisfy the objectives set out by paragraphs four and five. And so really, th this is probably the most important paragraph as far as my appeal is concerned, because what this shows shows two things. It shows, firstly, <laughs> that the judge is reading the objectives set out by paragraphs four and five into the claims. Secondly, it shows that the reason that the skilled person accepts um, uh, the promise of paragraphs four and five is because of the experimental results in the patent. That's why he found the promise plausible. Uh, and um, of course, the question that then arises is, if you have a document without any of these experiments, that is the priority document, how can you find the same invention to be plausible when the judge has placed such emphasis on the result, on the data, on showing the blocking group and fluorescent labels being removed and reincorporated. And, uh, and we say this is the error that the judge uh, clearly fell into uh, in his claims of priority. So my lords, that's the invention in the patent as the judge understood it. Um, that is to say the provision of a blocking group which satisfy the objectives set out in paragraphs four and five. And as I've said, um, the experimental results were crucial to the judge, um, and that's partly because he found that the common general knowledge would not give the skilled person the necessary basis for belief in the contribution in the patent. On the contrary, as the judge found, as I showed you earlier, uh, the skilled person would not be optimistic based on the common general knowledge <coughs> that he could achieve, he or she could achieve uh, success in this technique um, with this or any other type of uh, blocking group. Um, so, my lords, uh, in the judgment, the judge now deals with construction. I don't think I need to deal with that, and I'll come back to obviousness later. So, if I may now turn to the section on priority, which begins at paragraph uh, 233. Um, 234, the judge um, summarises the prior art, which comes into the case if priority is lost. That's the Barnes disclosure, and there's no dispute about that. Um, um, it wasn't in dispute below either. Then in 235, uh, he turns to the law, um, and he refers to the requirement for an enabling disclosure in 235. Um, uh, he refers to the argument, our argument on priority in 236, and our reliance on the fact that there was uh, no experiment. But what he fails to do is, um, when it comes to his actual decision, he doesn't refer back to his earlier findings about the experiments and about their impact on the disclosure and their support for the claim and the uh, contents of paragraphs four and five, and that's where he falls into error. So he, he, he deals with it, does identify the right argument, but he doesn't deal with it consistently in our submission. Um, 237, uh, he uh, deals with the text, textual aspect of priority. Um, but of course, that's not our point. The, the point is not, um, is the text present? It's whether there is fair support for the invention in the priority document, because um, if you could just write down words, and that was enough, then that wouldn't stop armchair claiming, just um, uh, as uh, Lord Sumption identified. So there has to be something more than merely the text. Um, and uh, in 238, he, the judge correctly identifies that we rely on, relied on the fact that there was no data in the priority document to support the claimed utility. Um, uh, and, and he says that's um, not the whole story, because he refers to contents of uh, the example in the prior document, 
Well, just before you go on, I presume you rely upon the statement or the reference, the, the language to support the claimed utility as an, an acceptance that there is a claimed utility. Yes, I do. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, that's clear in, in our submission from, from the, the other parts of the judgment. Yeah. Um, so and just and moreover, that support is required. Absolutely, yes. yes. And indeed, the judge, when he summarises, he, he uses the word plausible. So it's clear he, did, he had the right principle in mind, he just didn't apply it in a consistent way. Well, just before, it's probably more helpful to, to turn to this in the prior document itself, but just let me remind you, um, so your lordships have a, have a note by these paragraphs, that the, the particular paragraphs which we rely on for the judges' uh, reliance on the data are 150, as I've shown you, um, 151, 152, um, and also the findings of common general knowledge in con to be contrasted with his findings on uh, in the patent, and that is really at 126, um, and also 141, where he made the point about um, the Azido methyl, the expectation of Azido methyl being incorporated in the common general knowledge. So that those are those are the core paragraphs which one has to have in mind in our submission when looking at the judge's finding on priority, which he he appeared not to do. So, my lords, um, judge relies on example one uh, in the priority document. He sets it out in paragraph two three eight, um, and he describes it correctly in paragraph 239 <coughs> as an assertion um, uh, 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 and uh, we, we say that that's right he um, uh, then quoted from Professor Ledley in 239 but all Professor Ledley is actually doing there is just really regurgitating the text in the priori priority document and it's right of course that the text discloses certain things um, but the question is whether or not um, uh, that is properly supported. <coughs> so I think that's the, probably the right time to look at the priority document, which is in the supplementary bundle at tab 4. Turn on to page 99 of the uh, text. Um, th there is a passage which um, uh, is the equivalent of, of paragraph 5. It's in a different place, but, you, but it, it is there um, in the priority document, um, uh, just in case your lordship are wondering. Um, and then on page uh, 102, uh, your Lordships can see just starting at line uh, 31 of 102, um, the passage saying, in, in a preferred embodiment, the 3' OH group is blocked with, for example, an azido methyl group as a protective form of hemiaminal, or a 3 to 4 dimethyoxybenzyl of the oxymethyl group as a protective form of hemiacetal. However, other suitable protecting groups may well be used, as disclosed in Green and Woods protective groups in organic synthesis, John Wiley and some. And your Lordships may have seen reference to Green and Woods 
in the judgments, in other passages. This is the, the textbook that contains lists of um, suitable groups for different uses. Um, but we, we certainly uh, rely on the fact that as far as the skilled person reading this with their common general knowledge, they read this as disclosing that um, the azido methyl group may be preferred, but other suitable protecting groups can be used from the common general knowledge source, that is green and woods. And we say, of course, the skilled person would read this with their common general knowledge expectations in mind um, in relation to the potential success of a technique such as this. Then we come to the examples themselves, uh, and they start on page uh, 113. Um, and uh, we see uh, what is said, 3 um, oh protected with an azido methyl group is a protected form of hemianimal, hemianimal, and the um, uh, group is set out there showing the azido methyl. But note that there is um, no linker attached to this group, it is just the azido methyl. Um, and then uh, it's said, nucleotides bearing this blocking group at the Three prime position have been shown to be successfully incorporated by a number of different polymerases, block efficiently, and may be subsequently removed under neutral aqueous conditions using water soluble phosphines or thiols, allowing further extension. And then um, the diagram is set out below with uh, uh, various reagents listed um, uh, and the various steps shown. Um, but note that there is no second incorporation um, talked about here, just a single step. Um, and what is missing, what is also missing, as well as the complete absence of any linker um, uh, referred to, is in the patent there is extensive disclosure following this as to how to uh, make um, the uh, azido-methyl group. That is also missing from the prior step. And indeed this, this equation and these conditions. What's the relevance of that? I, I'm just trying to compare the two documents, but I don't think it matters for the purposes of, of um, uh, the appeal. But certainly, there is there's a lot less in the priority document than the patent. Not just this um, uh, disclosure as compared to the experiments we've looked at in detail, but there's also a whole load of additional material in the patent telling you how to make the azido methyl group um, in the various ways. That, that's, the, that's the extent of the um, disclosure on, on the various steps. And then your lordship will see um, the claims follow. Um, and uh, those are truly uh, Marcouche claims. Um, claim one uh, with, with the various groups set out. Um, and then claim three does specify the azido methyl as being uh, the molecule of claim one where X is azido methyl. Well, that, that's the disclosure of um, uh, the prior document. But there's a bizarre point made in my learned friend's skeleton for the first time um, uh, where they suggest that because the priority document is written by, in inverted commas, an entirely credible researcher, that somehow it's um, uh, easier to demonstrate plausibility. Um, uh, what we understand by this is because um, the name on the front of the patent is Selexa Limited, somehow um, they are deemed to be uh, entirely credible and that um, a research group um, connected to an ancient university um, gives the disclosure more credence than if the application had been made by an individual working out of their garden shed. Um, well, also, we, we, we don't, that can't be right. We, the name on the front of the patent or the, the, the attribution of uh, the uh, applicants as, as credible researchers cannot be relevant to the question of plausibility. Um, uh, uh, there's not some hierarchy of non-peer-reviewed statements in these sorts of documents, um, and we, we say that can't assist my learning friends um, at all. The more important point is um, whatever the name on the front of the patent, um, uh, we just don't see how the stringent requirements of paragraphs four and five of the patent can be plausibly satisfied by the prophetic experiment in example one. Uh, and we remind the court of 
um, the Metzger prior art. Well, you described it as a prophetic experiment, but the judge didn't find that it was. He seems to have accepted that that was a possibility, but he made no finding that it was prophetic. Yes, well, I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. But what, what he did is he, he said it didn't matter whether it was prophetic or not. So we say that's as good as, as, good as finding it is prophetic. He really? Says, Why? Well, because he says it's good enough. Even if it was prophetic, it's good enough. And we say um, that shows the flaws in his arguments because we don't understand how this could possibly be um, enough support if, as he agrees, was a possibility, it was prophetic. And that shows he plainly fallen into error. That, 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 would, be, um, that would be contrary to everything that um, uh, Lord Sumption said in Warner Lambert. If you just write something out and it's got no basis whatsoever, um, if that's, you can get a patent that way, that would be contrary to all the authorities. And so we say the fact that the judge accepted that it, even if it was prophetic, it was enough, we say shows that he'd fallen into error and was applying the wrong standard. Um, and my lords, we, we remind you that the judge had already found that the Metzger prior art showed uh, the addition of a second base after the removal of the nitrobenzyl group. Um, and we can say that, show that even if you would think this wasn't prophetic, um, this was a real experiment, this experiment doesn't go as far as the Metzger prior art had gone, because it does not show the addition of a, of a further base. And um, based on uh, the skilled person's common general knowledge attitude, as summarized in paragraphs 126 and 141 of uh, the judgment, um, the skilled person would just not think it plausible that the stringent requirements of paragraphs four and five have been met, even if for some reason they were to accept um, that this experiment had actually been carried out. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's no theory or explanation why azidomethyl is said to be better than the prior art. Um, indeed, it's not even it's not suggested to be better, as I showed you in the passage on page 102 of the bundle, um, it is said only to be as good as uh, the Green and Woods uh, lists of molecules that the skilled person had available from the common general knowledge. Um, moreover, um, uh, claim one is a broad claim covering multiple groups, or multiple different um, uh, additions to the molecule. Even claim three um, can still have all the alternatives um, for the R groups, etc in the molecule. Yeah, um, sorry, on that point, why do we worry about the priority of claim one? Surely it's, it's sufficient if claim one is, in, claim three is entitled to priority. Well, yes, but, but even claim three has X is fixed, but all the other groups are, are, are variable in claim three. Um, and um, uh, we say that, that that's also relevant. Um, so if we go and see what the, how the judge dealt with this in the judgment, and it's really the passage at, at 239 onwards. He, he, he firstly um, refers to it correctly, as I said, as an assertion. He, he then quotes from Professor Ledley. But as I say, Professor Ledley has only really just parroted the, the wording in the uh, specification that just says it discloses certain things. Well, there's no dispute about what it discloses. The question is whether it provides proper support. And then the judge goes on in 240 and says, based on this, seems to me that the conclusion that the claims are entitled to priority must follow. The same invention is disclosed in both the priority document and the patent. Disclosure in the priority document supports the claims and is an enabling disclosure. It also provides plausible information which supports the idea that a sequencing by synthesis scheme based on the claim three prime azidomethyl blocking group will work. Uh, and we say um, uh, we don't understand how the judge can make that finding because there is no data in the patent, there are no experiments, and on the judge's own findings in relation to the patent, um, that, th that data and those experiments were highly relevant to his findings um, uh, that the uh, invention was supported, uh, and indeed as to the nature of the invention. And in the absence of that data and those experiments, we just don't understand how uh, the judge can say uh, that there is the same support 
in the priority document as in the patent. Well, he doesn't say it's the same support. He says it's the same invention. And then he says it's sufficient in the priority document to support the claims. Yes, but he, he's defined the invention in the early passages by reference to the experiments uh, and the data. And he said this is a, an important and significant development um, because of the data and the experiments that are, are disclosed. And that's why um, the uh, uh, molecule claimed uh, and the methods claimed are said to have a stringency, the objectives set out by paragraphs four and five. So in our submission, if you take away that data and those experiments, um, you cannot conclude that the three azido methyl blocking group satisfies the objectives set out by paragraphs four and five. And if that is the invention that the judges arrived at when looking at the patents, that invention cannot be supported by the prior document in the absence of the data and the experiments. So the judge, I'm afraid, um, had fallen into error. Um, indeed, we say on the judge's approach, um, it's effectively an armchair priority document just write down. Well, can you help me on that? Because I note it's asserted in the respondent's skeleton that it was never suggested in the evidence at trial that this was a prophetic example. Is that correct? My Lord, um, I don't know whether... Professor Levy didn't comment on the example more than the evidence you've seen above. Well, he takes it at face value. He does, and, and, I, and, and I'm assuming that there's no there was no evidence from Professor Mark saying this is fiction. Well, uh, that's right. That's right. It, it certainly, would, it was it was certainly argued. Um, uh, I, I, I don't recall putting it to Professor Ledley um, on the basis that he hadn't um, put forward a contrary view. But we will check that over the shorter journey. And so, my lord, we say effectively this is a, a rubber stamp for, for armchair priority documents. Um, and moreover, the, the, the way the judge um, seems to think this works is that you're given enough to go ahead and do some more experiments to see um, effectively the experiments and the patents to provide um, the support for the invention. But that's akin to saying that the priority document makes the invention obvious, not that the priority document has supported it. And that, of course, is contrary to the law, um, as I showed you um, in uh, uh, Beloit um, uh, and in, in, in the floorboards case. Uh, and so, my lord, we say um, there is insufficient support in the judge's findings in 240, particularly compared to um, uh, his earlier findings on the patent. Um, and in 241, he goes on to say, um, one might have a degree of scepticism in the way example one is written, the assertion of 100% yield and the absence of gels, whether such a test really had been carried out, or whether this is, was a so-called prophetic example. However, on the facts of this case, I find that does not matter. It does not render what is described any less plausible. And this is the point we just can't understand. But effectively, the judge is saying, well, even if it is prophetic, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, uh, and that's where yeah. well, the, the, I, can I ask you two questions? I mean, before we get on to that, I mean, I think my first question really arises out of what he says in 240. Now, you may not be able to answer this question, but in your submission, what test of plausibility is the judge applying there? Well, he seems to be applying a lower test. His test is, um, it's the last sentence of 240, um, does sequencing by synthesis scheme based on the claim three prime uh, azidomethyl blocking group work? And that, of course, is not the same as saying, I'm disclosing a scheme which has all of the features of paragraphs four and five of the pattern. Because that's a, that's, I mean, in some senses, the Metzger scheme worked. You, you, you've got a, you were able to add a blocking group, de-block, and then add another base. That is a round of um, uh, sequencing by synthesis. But in the judge's mind, the patent was 
disclosing and claiming rather more than that. He was putting it much higher. He had, you had to have a, a, a bells and whistles version which had um, a, a stable, long-term stability for the blocking group. Um, it would, had to be efficiently incorporated. There had to be total blocking. Uh, and there had to be uh, the blocking group had to be removed under conditions which didn't cause damage. And we say um, none of those uh, uh, features are um, supported by the example in the priority document, um, particularly if, if you think it's only prophetic. Moreover, there's no linker shown. There's no, no evidence that you could do this with a linker or a label, um, contrary to the uh, uh, um, what's said in the patent. Uh, and so we say that um, it's miles away, really, from, from the judge's understanding of what uh, paragraphs four and five are promising in the patent and the promise um, that is upheld on his understanding by the, the, the experiments and data in the patent. And so we say um, all, all of that is missing, and he has clearly gone for a lower, a lower target, just some form of um, sequencing by synthesis which works, and that is even less than, for instance, the Metzger paper showed because there isn't a further round of, of um, uh, bases added in the patent, in, sorry, in the priority document, even on even if you accept that it actually took place. Can I, <coughs> can I ask a question about 241? Of course not. Um, because from what you've said so far, um, I, I don't understand it either. But the reason I don't understand it is that I can't see why the judge was addressing the question of whether this might be a prophetic example, given that um, that wasn't in the evidence, it wasn't your case, and in paragraph 239 he's accepted Professor Ledley's evidence that the um, priority document discloses, in Professor Ledley's wording, that um, the modified nucleotides have been shown to be successfully incorporated. I, from the perspective of someone who's obviously not a patent lawyer, that looks like a finding that the, that the document says that and is not a prophetic example. Well, Lord, certainly we made these submissions in closing that it was prophetic. Mm. That, that, that was, so it was a point that was before the judge, which is no doubt why he dealt with it in, um, uh, in 241. And um, it's quite common to find in patents um, some examples where data is given and, and one can see that an experiment has been done, and other examples where steps are set out which could be carried out, um, and those are part of what are called prophetic examples. They're, they're, you could go and do this if you wanted, yeah. um, but they haven't actually been done. And so um, our submission um, was that this would be understood not to have been actually done because no data was provided, no, no, no support was given for... Um, the, the scheme. I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by what you've just told me, Mr. Sue. So let, let's start with the basics. There's nothing wrong with writing a prophetic example in your patent application. Um, moreover, it is done from time to time. People make predictions and they turn out to be vindicated. So that in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. No. But if you have a dispute as to what a patent application discloses to the skilled person, then it may be highly relevant as to whether the skilled person would interpret what's written as being an actual experiment with real results or simply a hypothesis, that is to say, a prophetic example. And if there is a dispute about that, one would expect it to be addressed in the evidence of the experts because it is the experts who assist us to read the document through the eyes of the skilled person. And therefore, I'm a little puzzled by what you seem to be telling me, which is that a submission is made that is a prophetic example unsupported by any evidence. Yes, but it seems to be a submission. I, I understand the point you're just making, but it seems to be a submission the judge, he's dealt with it in 241. He said, even if it is prophetic, it doesn't matter. And we say that underlines that he must have fallen into error, because he's saying, um, OK, I assume it is prophetic. I still think there's enough disclosure here. And we say that must be wrong, because if it's prophetic, if there is no data anywhere in this patent to support um, uh, the assertion that azido-methyl works, 
then the skilled person is in no better position than they are with the common general knowledge, where they are um, uh, not optimistic. In fact, they might think it wouldn't work at all. Uh, and um, uh, we say um, that that is really the, the problem with 241, is that um, the judge has, by dealing with it, purporting to deal with it as if it was a prophetic example, he's underlined the error he's fallen into. Because on his understanding, it makes no difference. Um, and, and we say if it is a prophetic example, um, it would be no different to the long list of leaving groups um, in Green and Woods, for instance. Uh, but based on that, the, skill, the judge had already found that the skilled person was not optimistic of success. And so um, we, we really use 241 as a way of demonstrating that the judge has applied the wrong standard. Because if he had applied the right standard, he ought to have found it would make a difference whether the skilled person found it prophetic or not. And um, because he has plainly applied the wrong standard, and because my own friends don't have a respondent's notice, we say that the only conclusion you can come to is that the judge fell into error in determining whether or not um, uh, priority was, was properly uh, claimed. Yeah, so, so rephrasing what you just said uh, in slightly different words, you say it plainly does matter whether the example is prophetic or not. That's precisely why the submission was made in the first place, whether or not there was evidence to support it. Indeed. Um, and um, that must show, you say, uh, that he's misinterpreting uh, the disclosure of the document. So I'm, not, I'm not asking your lordships to find that it was prophetic or not. That, that's not the point. The point is that the judge found it didn't matter, and that underlines that he fell into error. Because it, 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 it must matter. He must, it must matter based on the law that I showed you earlier. Otherwise, anyone could write out um, a, a, a patent uh, at their heart's content with no possible support. Um, and that would be the, uh, the problem of armchair patenting, which Lord Sumption um, correctly identified. So we say for all these reasons that the test the judge applied plainly didn't satisfy um, the standard which Lord Assumption set out in paragraph 36 of Warner Lambert. Um, uh, uh, and we, we um, uh, submit that um, the absence of, a, absence of any uh, second incorporation, um, the absence of any data, any gels, um, the absence of the skilled person being able to make the, arrive at the conclusions which judge held the skilled person would do reading the experiments and the patent uh, and the emphasis that the judge put on those experiments and data support the claims, uh, the claimed invention that he set out earlier in the judgment means that um, that same invention cannot be properly supported by the priority document um, and for all those reasons uh, you ought to find that the judge fell into error. Um, now my lords, um, in our submission we can go even further than this because um, when we come on to the judge's findings on obviousness, um, uh, we say this further underlines why the judge was wrong on priority. Because on the judge's findings on obviousness, um, the skilled person could have no expectation of, for example, incorporation based on the size of the azidomethyl molecule. There was no basis, in, in his view, for thinking that the azidomethyl molecule would be incorporated. Um, from the prior art, and none of that is explained in the, in the priority document. There's no um, assertion, no reasoning, no scientific theory, nothing at all to suggest that this azidomethyl group is any different to any of the uh, other groups in the prior art. Um, and the consequence of this is that the, claim, uh, the claims must be rejected uh, in toto um, uh, for priority, and on that basis the claims uh, should be found in toto obvious over the Barnes prior art, um, which Illumina has never disputed. So, my lords, if I may now turn to the obviousness part of my appeal. Um, and this really, I'm going to be much briefer uh, on this side of it because this really is the flip side of the points we've already been over at some length in relation to priority and the common general knowledge. Uh, and so, my appeal on obviousness is based on the premise that the claims do have priority and that it's not necessary 
uh, to satisfy the stringent requirements in the patent for the blocking group. Um, uh, in other words, all that the patent is disclosing is what the priority document discloses, which is an alternative blocking group to be used in the known technique of sequencing by synthesis. And so the judge's errors in relation to obviousness turn on his improper or incorrect elevation of the inventive contribution, if he was right on priority, um, and his failure to focus on uh, the words of the claim, again, on the basis that he was right on priority. Um, and we can pick this up in, in a couple of ways. Um, uh, firstly, um, we point out, as uh, Lord Justice Nugie has already observed, um, um, the claim wording is rather uh, less than the wording included in paragraph four and five of the patent. Um, uh, and it's not in dispute that the claims, even the method claims, only in fact required two cycles of incorporation to be satisfied. Um, and again, I remind your lordships, two cycles is exactly what the Metzger 1994 prior art showed. And so uh, on that well, basis... Well, of course, that depends on exactly how you defe define a cycle. I mean, I haven't looked at the wording of the claim with this point in mind, but you could say that um, uh, Metzger is, is one and a half cycles. Yeah, I, 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 I take your point, my lord. I, I, it, because it depends whether you've required it to be the same. Because a full phase. cycle is incorporation um, uh, and then um, deblocking, um, uh, ready for the next one. Um, and so, if you've got two of those, you've added two, and you've unblocked the second. I, 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 I accept that characterisation. I'll, I'll, I'll come back and, and make make my submission more accurate by reference to claims when I when I get there. All right. Um, so, my lords, the, 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 the passages um, where this shown to be not in dispute in the judgment. Can I just show you Lordships those? So if we pick it up firstly at 164. <clears throat> and um, uh, the judge in 164 refers to um, at least one incorporation. So it, it may be that it's, it's my fault by referring to two full cycles and I'm asked that uh, that's the error that um, I've set that hair running. And then, yes, so, so if your lordship um, turns, for instance, to page 188, uh, 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 you see the judge refer to at least one in 164. Sorry, I'm lost. Where are Sorry. Um, in the bundle, in the core bundle, yes. um, I was at 164 of the judgment, yes. where he refers to at least one incorporation, and then you can yes. see that wording mirrored in claim 12, for instance, on page 188 of the bundle, the annex to the claims in at the end. Right. Um, and it, it may be that um, the true answer is midway between the two extremes. So what, what claim 12 refers to is at, at least one incorporation Yes, wherein at least one incorporation is of a nucleotide as defined in any one of the claims, the earlier claims. So in that, you, you need to have more than one incorporation, but only one of those incorporations needs to be the 3 azeda methyl nucleotide. So on that basis, we would say it's no different to Metzger. Obviously, Metzger wasn't the 3 azeda methyl, but it's the same, same interpretation. But if, if I've, I'll look at that over lunch, my lords, and, and if I've need to learn friends muttering, so maybe I've got that wrong. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that if I need to. The, for the purposes of my submission, the only point I need to make is that the judge recognised that the method claims only require at least one incorporation, that's 164, and then in 293, uh, we have... Um, this is in, in the context of sufficiency. Uh, he refers to, say, he says, I start with the claim language. Claim 12 relates to a method of sequencing at least one nucleotide. It doesn't matter how many sequences 
our sequence as long as one nucleotide is sequenced. Uh, the claim will be infringed if a person is sequenced 100, um, etc., etc. In my judgment, as a matter of construction, this claim is not a claim to a range of read lengths. So it's only, it just needs at least one. Uh, and then at 294, um, uh, he goes on to say, right at the end of 294, it cannot be said that sequencing more than one nucleotide is the essence or core of the invention of claim 12 either. So again, he, he, he's limiting, for the purpose of sufficiency at least, claim 12 to a requirement to just sequence um, uh, one nucleotide. He goes on again in 295. Um, to, this is the, the, the underpins his finding on sufficiency. Since the patent clearly enables sequencing at least one nucleotide, then there's no general insufficiency. The same conclusion applies to claim seven. Um, and then he, in 298, uh, he deals with this squeeze point that I've, I've raised. Um, and uh, he says, there is an advantage. It isn't, there is an advance over Mexico 1994. Um, and the reason he gives in 298 is about two thirds of the way down. He says there is a technical advance for the reasons already referred to. Essentially, the azido methyl blocking group does meet the stringent requirements referred to in the patent. So it's clear again that the judge is reading into the claim the additional requirements of stringency. Um, uh, that he's identified from paragraphs four and five of the patent. And we say, um, he, he, he points this out when he deals with construction. Um, he points it out when he deals with obviousness. He points it out when he deals with sufficiency. But he completely omits this point when he deals with priority. And again, that's the error he's fallen into because he just hasn't asked himself the question as to whether or not the priority document um, provides support for the azido methyl blocking group uh, meeting the stringent requirements referred to in the patent. And if he had asked the question, we say he, he plainly would have said no for the reasons I've been through and, and the um, absence of patent, uh, absence of experiments, absence, absence of data. But in some senses, that's that doesn't matter because my learned friends haven't got a response notice on that point. So, my lords, that that that's underlines um, uh, the judge's findings in, when it comes to sufficiency. But if we go now back to the prior art and how he deals with um, the prior art Zadgorodny, uh, that uh, is a passage beginning at 184 of uh, the judgment. Conscious of the time, um, I'm about to, to, to spend a few moments looking at the prior art. I, I don't know whether your lordships, I'm, I'm doing well. I will be, I will sat down by half past two um, uh, in any event. Well, if, if you would rather take lunch five minutes early, um, then we can break now uh, and resume at five to two. Very grateful. Okay. All right.